Mr. Chairman, dear Mr. Seliger, I think I have two disadvantages compared to the other speakers today. I cannot use my native language and I'm so tired because I just came from Europe. But I think for the interpreters, interpreters it will be good because I had been asked to speak slowly and if I speak slowly then I apologize because of the two reasons. So I'm very thankful to be here. I feel very honored to be here with you and to share some experiences we made in Germany. And when I read the papers at the beginning, I was really impressed about your activities um, to improve the situation of political prisoners in North Korea and to publish serious information about human rights violations uh, there. When I read these papers, um, it uh, was for me like uh, travel of time back in the 80s in Germany. When I was uh, young and I studied and we also tried to develop activities to improve the situation of political prisoners in East Germany. For example, as a student I founded a committee for the release of a dissident who was imprisoned this time in GDR in East Germany. Even in this prison where I am now the head of a memorial and that probably can make you also optimistic the time will change and there will be also democracy in North Korea one day. As you know, Germany was divided <coughs> more than 40 years. We had a communist regime in the East with 17 million inhabitants and we had a democratic system in the West with 60 million inhabitants. So the relation is also a little bit comparable probably to Korea. And in 1989, so more than 20 years ago, this communist, communist regime came uh, down through a peaceful revolution. No blood fled. It was really a peaceful process of winning democracy in East Germany. So probably this uh, historical experiences are also interesting for you and probably they, are, they also can you encourage that the struggle for human rights can be uh, successful. In Germany we had some special conditions compared to Korea I think. At first a lot of people escaped from East Germany between 1949 and 1989, 3.6 million East Germans left East Germany, so approximately 20% of the population left. And we had much closer personal relationships than you have here. We could visit each, each other, we could write letters, we could make some difficult but it was working phone calls and uh, this was also something which is different I think from the situation here and there was the influence of the West German medias nearly everybody in East Germany could receive West German TV programs and if not then West German radio programs and uh, they had been informed uh, and they could participate in the um, public debates in a way which um, existed in this time in West Germany. So this was probably also a big difference compared to the situation in Korea. If you look back on this time of four, four decades of uh, division, uh, there are different phases, different uh, times, different uh, uh, strategies also how to overcome the communist regime. The 50s, I would like to call the decade of direct confrontation. There weren't no 
diplomatic relations between East and West Germany. And uh, there was a big resistance inside East Germany and also outside those who left East Germany tried to struggle against the communist regime from the western part of Germany. And um, this uh, unsatisfied people tried to make an uprising very uh, four years after the foundation of East German and uh, of, of Sigilia in 1953. There was a big uprising in East Germany, which was nearly successful because uh, they occupied nearly all the official buildings of the Communist Party and they make uh, big uh, demonstrations and uh, uh, nearly all the big factories um, didn't work at this time. But then the Soviet troops came and um, they ended this uh, uprising of 1953. In the West, there were certain organizations uh, to strengthen the resistance against the communist regime. In my paper, which is printed out, um, I uh, am telling about some of these organizations. For example, the Committee of Libertarian Lawyers, or the Fighting Group Against Inhumanity, and every party had a so-called East Office, which uh, was responsible for improving the situation in East Germany and for fighting against the communist regime in East Germany. And they developed really interesting methods in this time, how to influence the East German population which was living under the communist regime. For example, they printed leaflets, millions of leaflets, which were transported by balloons over the border and they went down on the eastern side of the border. They printed often masked books and newspapers on very thin paper which, which you could smuggle in the east and uh, which you could uh, discover, uh, which you could uh, hide there, and um, these newspapers um, were filled with um, detailed information about uh, the situation of farmers, for example, um, of uh, state administration and uh, of uh, function fun functionaries, and uh, so they, they tried to develop, to give information to certain groups in the society to encourage them to show resistance, to give them information about the real life um, and to correct the influence of the propaganda, the communist propaganda in this time. And they also gave instructions how to assure, for example, the reception of Western transmitters. Um, they explained how to behave during recruitments uh, for the secret police as informers police. Um, they also published the names of the Stasi employees and the Stasi informers, so this was the name of the secret police in East Germany, Stasi, this, name, uh, this um, uh, was um, the abbreviation for a state security service or ministry for state security, Stasi, and um, so they published the name of uh, the employees and the informers, and uh, for example they printed official or nearly official stamps with the portrait of the president of East Germany but uh, there was one thing changed on the stamps the president had a, how do you call it uh, a strong wait a moment a quantify uh, of the communist leader but with a cord around his neck so you could uh, uh, read it like uh, that it would be better if the president would be dead. And uh, so they smuggled these stamps into the GDR and you couldn't see the difference at the first in the first moment, but uh, when you studied more intensively the stamps then you could see that it was a kind of counter-propaganda against the communist regime. And they didn't only promote 
resistance. They also tried to disturb governing in GDR. For example, communist functionaries in GDR had got uh, faked invitations to official conferences, to uh, receptions, and even to holidays to spend some time on a, a nice island in the north of East Germany. And the functionaries went there, and when they arrived, they saw that uh, this invitation was a fake. And um, they faked also official announcements um, to the state uh, shops that they should reduce the prices. Then all the shops reduced their prices and the government, and then it came out that this, this was a fake. And they couldn't correct it because then the people would be uh, very uh, ang angry because of that. So they let the prices uh, down. And they faked also letters to commercial partners in the West that their Eastern partners, the Eastern companies, um, couldn't continue the cooperation with them and they had to stop. And so the Western enterprises saw that uh, they ended the cooperation with them. So it was a really interesting case how to show resistance, how to develop resistance against the communist time with a lot of fantasy and a lot of direct actions. On the other hand side, the secret police uh, reacted with a lot of arrests of people who had been involved in these actions. They kidnapped uh, supporters from the West. More than 400 people had been kidnapped from the East German secret police and brought to the East from the west to the east. And they also developed a sophisticated network of police informers uh, in the west and in the east. So um, people who had been involved in these activities often paid a very high price. They stayed for years in prison and um, then uh, if you look back, you also have to ask uh, if this price was probably too high to pay for this, at this time, unsuccessful resistance. The communist regime also reacted with the construction of the Berlin Wall in 1961. This uh, famous Berlin Wall had two reasons. The first one was to stop the emigration movement from the east to the west. As I told you before already, uh, millions of East Germans left, uh, and especially through Berlin, because this was the only place where it was still possible, also years after the founding of GDR. So you could go from the eastern part to the western part of Berlin by using the subway, and then you could take a plane and could go to, the, to West Germany. So a lot of people did so. Also my parents escaped in 1959, and, uh, and they used also this way. And um, so to stop this immigration movement, uh, the uh, Communist Party constructed the Berlin Wall, but also to stop the influence and activities of the anti-communist groups in the West. Therefore, the 60s were a new decade, and I would like to call it the dec decade of stand still, because nothing <coughs> moved in this time. There weren't any diplomatic uh, relations between East and West Germany, only very few personal contacts because of uh, the wall and closed border. For example, my parents who escaped, as I told you before, in 1959, they couldn't visit their parents during several years in the 60s. So there were no contacts in this time. Also, if you wanted to go from the western part to, of Berlin to the eastern part, it was no longer possible in both directions. And therefore, the activities of the supporters of uh, criticism towards communism concentrated to help people to flee and to come out of East Germany. They tried to build tunnels, for example. 
and Berlin especially, these tunnels were built by students under the Berlin Wall, and on the other hand side, uh, it was arranged that uh, uh, their relatives or friends um, could uh, leave East Germany through this tunnel, uh, or they faked uh, passports that East Germans could leave uh, their state. Um, but uh, these activities were also controlled uh, after a while by the state security service, so they had their informers in these groups and uh, they knew uh, openly about uh, these tunnels before they had been ready. And there's one case, a um, um, political prisoner who was also in my prison in Hohenschönhausen. He was uh, building a tunnel and when he came out on the other end side, they shot on him and his friend was dead and he was uh, hurted, he was injured and he is still the, how do you call it, the bullet in his lung. And uh, so this was also only possible in a few cases and for a short while. And in GDR, there was no direct resistance anymore because uh, it was too dangerous and all the groups, the oppositional groups had been destroyed by the political police and there was also a lack of a political perspective because uh, the East German population saw that the West didn't react on the construction of the Berlin Wall. So they thought the Americans would help them and wouldn't accept the construction of the Berlin Wall, but nothing happened. And they saw, we are all in a big prison here. We cannot leave anymore. So we have to arrange ourselves. And um, this arrangement of the population with the political regime um, is a point which is still important uh, also nowadays because um, if there's a arrange arrangement between a dictatorship and the population after the end of the dictatorship, these people are not very interested to speak about this time and to see with whom they arranged. And um, so this is still a problem that we have uh, in East Germany, some kind of uh, nostalgia um, that uh, the time and the life in, <coughs> during the communist uh, time was better for them, it was more secure and so on. So this nostalgia um, is still existing and it's uh, mostly because of the arrangement between part of the population and the political regime. In this time, the West German government started to buy out political prisoners of East Germany. It was an attempt to achieve something to improve the situation of political prisoners. They said, we give you money you release the political prisoners. And uh, this was a big business at the end for the GDR. They paid, uh, the West German government paid more than 1.7 billion euros. And the East German regime released more than 35,000 political prisoners. So it was really a big business for the communist regime. And this shows on the one hand side that it's probably not very moralic to deal with political prisoners. On the other hand side, their own situation improved because of this, they could come into freedom. And it strengthened also the relations because even when the Berlin Wall was built up, we had still this um, emigration out of GDR to West Germany. So this period of stillstand ended at the end of the 16th, especially because the West German politicians were looking for new political strategies to improve the situation between East and West, 
especially the situation of the population. For example, they started already at the end of the 60s um, to get an allowance that West Berlin citizens could visit relatives in East Berlin. So nearly their neighbors, they only had to pass one road, but they had to use the official entrance to the GDR. And so they started to negotiate with the communist regime to improve the daily life uh, of the population. And this is the beginning of the decade of detente, uh, the 70s. At the beginning of the 70s, the two German states um, signed a treaty about their relations. They um, developed nearly or semi-diplomatic relations. They didn't call it embassies, they called it permanent agency, but it was functioning like an embassy, so there were, were an official West German agency in East Berlin, and there was an official uh, agency of East Germany in West Germany and the uh, former capital Bonn. And both German states became a member of the United Nations. West Germany could send uh, journalists to East Germany. They lived there, only a few, and uh, there was a permission necessary to go there. But there were some correspondents um, working for Western medias. And this was very important because they had a direct view on the daily life and uh, uh, communist conditions. And uh, there was also a treaty that East Germany gave a special allowance to pass through the GDR from West Germany to West Berlin, because West Berlin was in the middle of GDR and not at the border to West Germany. So they had to go through GDR to uh, reach West Berlin, and they hadn't been controlled anymore. Uh, only the passport, but not the luggage, not the cars, so it went much quicker than before. This was also one attempt to improve the situation between the two German states. And um, then, in the middle of the 70s, there was a process uh, in, uh, of Helsinki, the so-called Conference on Security and Cooperation. Lord Elton already mentioned it. This was also very important and was a way uh, to find uh, more formal relations between uh, East and West. And also the econo economic uh, relations developed in this time. And uh, so a lot of enterprises produced in East Germany because it was cheaper there and uh, they also uh, sold uh, goods to East Germany and so on. This uh, decade of detent uh, had ambivalent consequences, in my point of view. To find against a regime which was even accepted by the West. So there wasn't a political perspective for a direct confrontation and a direct opposition. On the other hand side, East Germans started to use the rights which were written in these treaties, especially the Helsinki Treaty, but also the UN Human Rights Convention, which was also accepted by the GDR by getting member of the United Nations. And they wrote letters to the administration, uh, you signed this uh, UN Human Rights uh, Convention, you signed the uh, Treaty of Helsinki, and that's written on page, I don't know which one, that uh, everybody has a right to decide where he wants to live. So please allow me to leave East Germany on a legal way. And more and more, um, was, uh, there was a, a movement of people who tried to leave East Germany on a legal way. And they used these official treaties. And uh, another consequence 
of this um, politics of the tent and as the East, it called peaceful coexistence, was that um, the, the, the concept, the communist concept of the enemy, the capitalist enemy in the West, uh, which had to be fought, uh, wasn't working anymore because uh, they were in a way in friendship with the West. They had official relations, so the West cannot be the devil. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, this ideology, there was a process of erosion of the communist ideology, which went till the end of the communist regime, and which was also very important uh, for overcoming this system. On the other hand side, people also accepted the division of Germany, because if the two German governments um, make treaties and uh, they have official state relations, then everybody could see that uh, there isn't any perspective uh, of unification of the two German states. And this was really a problem, more in the West than in the East, because the West Germans um, accepted the division of Germany more and more. And uh, they thought it's naturally, and sometimes they argued that this is the price we have to pay for the Second World War and for the Holocaust and so on, for all the political crimes which were committed in the past. Um, and, um, but these people, these intellectuals, who argued like this, they didn't uh, live in the East, so they had to suffer, suffer under this price. Um, but this was a problem, that the division of Germany was more and more accepted um, in this process of official relations between East and West. And it was the same with the Helsinki process. On the one hand side, it was a recognition of the communist states in Eastern Europe. On the other hand side, the human rights um, were guaranteed uh, in this treaty of Helsinki. And these ambivalent consequences um, culminated in the 80s. And the 80s, you can call the decade on the way to the final crisis. On the one hand side, as I mentioned already, not only the West German government, but also the West German society accepted the GDR and the communist regime. For example, the national holiday in West Germany was the 17th of June, which was remembering uh, the uprising in 1953, what I mentioned before. But uh, this national holiday was uh, without any sense uh, for a lot of, or for the, most of the people. They had lost the real connection to its historical roots. They made a free day. It was summer, they spent some time outside, but they didn't reflect why we had this national day and that there was an uprising in 1953 and this uprising was to create democracy, free elections and uh, in East Germany as well and to create a unified Germany. So it was empty uh, of sense. And um, the, re the reunification was no longer uh, objective of West German politicians and political parties. And this was really a pity, because we hadn't been prepared in any way for the case of the re re reunification of Germany. Nothing was prepared. <coughs> And uh, I know you have a ministry for reunification re here in Korea, and we had this also in the past, but then we stopped these activities because of the pressure of East Germany. The East German government said it's a relict of the Cold War to have such a 
ministry and such uh, preparations for the day of the reunification. And when the reunification came, we hadn't been prepared at all. No concepts, what to do with the economy, what to do with the agriculture, what to do with the public administration. Uh, nothing was prepared and therefore we made a lot of mistakes after uh, the unification of Germany. Another consequence in this um, years was um, that there was nearly a, a kind of competition between West and West German politicians who had the closest relationships to the East German communist leader. So it was uh, a very strange situation seen from nowadays that every prime minister of the federal countries in Germany wanted to meet him, wanted to be photographed, photographed with him, and then he was invited in 1987 to West Germany, to the capital, uh, walking on the red carpet, uh, invited and, and uh, with, with all honors um, for a state president, a state uh, representative. And um, so you can say probably that the West German politicians develop some kind of collaboration with the East German politicians. I don't know if you remember the former German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder from the Social Democratic Party. Um, he was a good friend of um, East German communist leaders and um, this was uh, a development uh, of uh, this closed relationship. Then especially the Social Democratic Party uh, started uh, very close relationships to the Communist Party. They made a common paper, they agreed about common goals and about the will for dialogue. And they even tried to change the German constitution because in the German constitution it was written that uh, the German governments are obliged to attempt to come to reunify Germany and they wanted to uh, stop this and change the uh, constitution. And the social democratic governed federal countries stopped the payments for the public prosecutor office which registered in this time the political crimes in GDR. On the other hand side, in this 80s the GDR became more and more dependent uh, of West German, Germany and especially of the money, of the West German money. Already in 1982 East Germany was bankrupt then they gave them again money so they could keep in power some more years. But at the end, in 89, they were again bankrupt. And um, so there was a big economic dependence of GDR uh, on West German money. And inside of GDR, the space for independent social and political activities became bigger in this period mainly under the roof of the Protestant churches. There were independent environmental groups, for example, or independent peace groups. And uh, they published independent illegal newspapers in the GDR. And um, they also organized small demonstrations. Uh, and it was difficult to prohibit these because they tried to stay in the official frame of law. And um, I was in this time uh, an advisor of the Green Party, which was founded uh, new in this time. And we developed a concept of uh, which what we called a concept of trialogue, not dialogue, but trialogue. So we spoke, wanted to speak with the official representatives. But when we went to GDR, for example, to visit the Ministry for Environmental Affairs, we also visited uh, opposition groups in the same visit to, to strengthen their position. 
And Julia, Julia didn't want this, but uh, uh, we uh, tried it, and uh, I think we succeeded also to uh, develop this kind of politic of dialogue. So then came the final crisis. I have to come to the end. Um, and um, there were two main reasons. On the one hand side, a lot of people tried to leave East Germany by foreign embassies, especially in Czechoslovakia. They entered the embassy and they said, we don't leave the embassy uh, if, uh, till we aren't allowed to go to West Germany. And Hungary opened the Iron Curtain and then a lot of people flew through the Iron Curtain. And uh, on the other hand side, these tiny groups in East Germany um, started with uh, demonstrations and um, they became bigger and bigger and the regime was afraid to use military force against them because that would have meant the end of the period of detent and of cooperation between East and West and therefore they grew up and uh, they grew bigger and bigger and at the end it was not longer possible to use military forces because the demonstrations were too big. And also in the party and in the Communist Party um, and, and the, the part of the society which was supportive to the state, um, the criticism grew up against the government and how they handled these problems. And then in October 1989, the General Secretary, the leader of the Communist Party, was displaced and a new leader came to power. He tried to make reforms to democratize the system, but this caused even more critique, more demonstrations, and the will uh, to found new parties, independent parties, to have free elections, and uh, to have a reunified Germany. And that's, that was the end of the communist regime in East Germany. So what can one learn for the situation in Korea? I don't know the situation very well, so uh, I apologize if I am completely wrong. But what's going uh, on in my head is, um, I think it's important to strengthen the relations between the two states, the economic, political, and social relations, because it's necessary to get influence on the society in North Korea that uh, they get more information um, about the life and the whole world, and uh, especially in South Korea, and how is life like outside the communist regime. And probably it's also important to create an economic dependence. This was a very big factor in Germany. And third point, I think it could be useful to put North Korea in the frame of international treaties, and we, as we did with East Germany. And fourth, strengthening all kinds of imminent opposition. Um, in such a period as now, it's not realistic to create oppositional movements which want to overcome the communist regime. But probably it's possible to found a more independent social organizations with um, more practical political objectives like environmental protection, for example, or uh, how can we improve the life conditions of poor people and so on. And uh, also to use the proper objectives of the communist regime, their own goals. Um, what do they promise on the one hand side and what did they realize? I think this is also an important point uh, uh, which was uh, useful in the German situation. Uh, the fifth point, and it was interesting to hear what you said, Mr. President, at the beginning. I think we need new forms of influencing and of spreading democratic values in the remaining communist regimes. 
social medias, Facebook, YouTube, what you mentioned as well. And um, I think we can learn a lot about the Arab revolutions because uh, they um, were very successful by using these methods of organizing protests and so on. And we also must learn to organize international campaigns. For example, if you think on what happened some weeks ago with pussy riots in Russia, it was a very successful campaign. Um, people, especially in Europe, I don't know if you have been informed here as well um, about this case. Um, in every newspaper, it was written that three young women were arrested there because they uh, were uh, singing a song in a church and they were sentenced for two years in a labor camp in uh, Russia. And it was a very successful campaign. I think we can learn about this, how um, it's possible to make these uh, issues public. And we must um, concentrate on personal destinies, like Liu Xiaobo in China, the winner of the Nobel Prize for Peace. So we must uh, present very personal stories of people who suffered under the communist regime to create identification and emotions um, uh, all over the world. And last point, we must and we can be optimistic that at the end the wish to live in freedom is stronger than any dictatorship. That shows the example of Germany and I wish you the best that it happens also in Korea. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry that the pressure.